What do all of these animals have in common? The Gila Monster, the Orchard Swallowtail Caterpillar, the Peacock Manta Shrimp. They all have funny names. The Wonder Puss. Exit, stage left. How do they come up with these names? Like this. Ta-da! It's a fried egg jellyfish. Don't forget the secretary bird. Or the blue ribbon eel. And me, proboscis monkey. Get the scoop on what's what with your called what. Wait, what? Your called what? Coming up today, meet the super cute spider that eats other spiders. What? A girl's gotta live. Say hello, cocky, to a cockatoo wasp fish. Whoa! And if you dare to hang out with a group of bears, what would you call them? Anything they want me to. What do you get when you mix a thriving garden with a writhing underwater eel? A garden eel. You're called what? A garden eel. Kids, time to water the garden eels. These slithery sand dwellers are found in tropical Indo-Pacific waters from the Red Sea to Northwest Australia and throughout Micronesia. The perfect nursery for a garden is a sandy seabed. They also like to be in areas with plenty of seagrass, not just for garden edging. It helps them hide by blending in. Hey guys, springtime! The garden eel prefers safety in numbers, blooming in colonies that count from the dozens into the hundreds. The many eel heads popping up from their burrows to feed looks just like an underwater garden. Hey Rose, you look like you could do with some pruning. They grow up to half a metre long, keeping a third of its body safely below the ground. They spend their days with heads out in the current, waiting to catch any passing plankton. The garden eel has huge eyes to help spot the tiny tidbits. If the current also brings a predator, like a triggerfish, they don't have far to duck for cover. Lawnmower! Shh! Everybody quiet! Okay, okay, coast is clear. Garden eels are nifty little diggers. They drill their burrows with their tails and coat the walls with mucus to stop them from collapsing. Uh, what you keeping down there in your home, Doug? Nothing. Spotted like a leopard, it takes time for a garden eel to grow into its spots. Baby eels, called elvers, are born entirely black. They never stray from their little garden bed home, even laying eggs in their burrows. Time to get the little seedlings ready for the summer bloom. Garden eels, the underwater surprise you can really dig. What happens when you cross Shakespeare with a haircut, a great jumper and a creepy crawly spider? The Porsche Fringe Jumping Spider. You're called what? The Porsche Fringe Jumping Spider. Yeah! An arachnophobe's worst nightmare, a jumping spider. Boo. <laughs> If you're an arachnophobe, that means you're terrified of spiders. Unlucky for you if you live in Southeast Asia or Northern Australia, because that's where this jumper lives. The Porsche Fringe Jumping Spider loves a leafy forest, a dark cave. In fact, anywhere other spiders live. That's not because they're keen to make friends, it's because this is a spider that likes to eat other spiders. What? A girl's gotta live. They are very clever. So clever, they've developed calculated hunting techniques. And I jump. Did he tell you I jump? The cunning Porsche spider was named after the brilliant and ruthless character in Shakespeare's play, Merchant of Venice. I'm a classic, really. This spider is so furry, it's almost cute. Did he say almost? The Porsche fringe jumping spider has sniper-like vision with the large anterior eyes to help them lock in on their prey. Look into my eyes. You're feeling sleepy. Very sleepy. Web spiders, on the other hand, have poor vision, making them an easy target for these savage slayers. These sneaky hunters invade their victims' webs and are super skilled at moving on silk. Porsche spiders use their legs to vibrate the silk in specialised patterns. 
simulating struggling prey or mating signals. Like he said, very clever. The Porsche Fringe Jumping Spider. Lucky for us, these talented tricksters only go to 10 millimetres. So we won't be on the menu anytime soon. Bears are grizzly beasts who don't often hang out in big groups. But when they do, the group has a name all of its own. Can you guess what it is? Is it a stretch of bears? Or maybe a sloth? Or is it a snooze of bears? If you guessed a sloth of bears, you're right! Double what? A sloth of bears? Shh! Don't wake the bear! The most far-ranging bear in the world is the brown bear. You may spot a bear in the woods in Europe, Asia and North America. It's also known as a grizzly. A 300 kilogram grizzly can be up to two and a half metres tall when it stands up. That's another third bigger than your average dad. It takes its own time getting place to place. Its slow walk inspired the group name A Sloth of Bears. Say that to my face. I double dare ya. If you did, you'd better be a long way away. Brown bears have been clocked at speeds of nearly 50 kilometres per hour when they run. That's as fast as your car driving to school. Who are you calling a sloth now? Whilst these grizzly giants prefer to be alone or with very close family most of the time, they do enjoy the odd get-together. Here, fishy, fishy, fishy. The big annual party, the Alaskan Summer Feast. During the salmon run, a sloth of bears can number into the hundreds, but there are no slow coaches here. Let's go fishing! Each year, Alaskan salmon swim upstream to lay eggs. And for bears, it means an all-you-can-eat buffet. They are so busy fishing for the salmon rich in fats that they don't even mind each other's company. Bear cubs can stay with their mum for up to two and a half years. They sometimes mix with other close families and cubs. And like all kids, don't mind getting in a play fight. Hey, that was my spot. Ah, oh, quit your grizzling. When you're as big as a bear, you can choose to live life at your own pace. You can call them a sloth of bears. Just be sure to whisper it. ID crisis. What do you get when you cross the biggest mammal on land with the most playful mammal in the sea? An elephant seal! You're called what? An elephant seal! Hold up! An elephant and a seal? Which one am I then? Let's find out! There are two species of elephant seal. Take a coastal trip from Mexico to Alaska and you might spot a northern elephant seal colony. To see a southern elephant seal, you'll have to head below the equator. Northerners like offshore islands. Their South Pole cousins make a home of the Antarctic icebergs and rocky beaches. A far cry from the searingly hot African plains where elephants live. While elephants are the world's largest land mammal, elephant seals are the biggest seal. Males grow up to six metres long and can weigh around 4,000 kilograms. That's only about 2,000 less than an Asian elephant. Only? <laughs> sure. What's a few thousand kilograms? But these massive mammals aren't called elephant seals due to their sheer size. They too have an enormous long floppy snout. It's not that big. Uh, actually, a southern elephant seal trunk can be as long as a school ruler. OK, that's pretty big for a seal. And what good is a long nose if it can't play a few tunes? Like the elephant and proboscis monkey, it has an echo chamber to amplify snorts, grunts and bellows that can be heard several miles away. Yes, Jeffrey, I can hear you. I'm standing right here. So am I an elephant then? Nearly there, the elephant seal is part of a family called pinnipeds. It also includes sea lions and walruses. What? Pinnipeds. That means they aren't 100% aquatic. They are underwater hunters, though. They can hold their breath for two hours straight. <gasps> so that solves it. Only a seal could be a deep diving champion. The elephant seal, 
identity crisis solved. What do you get when you cross an island of Australia with the Lord of Darkness? A Tasmanian Devil! You're called what? That's right, a Tasmanian Devil! What are you looking at, huh? These cranky critters were once found all over Australia, but now they are only found in the wild in Tasmania and tiny east coast Maria Island. You can find them in coastal heath, open dry forest, wet forests and agricultural paddocks, anywhere their favourite foods are found. These feisty critters got their name from early European settlers. When they saw these rat-like animals with red ears, wide jaws and razor-sharp teeth, they decided it was the devil. The devil has long whiskers on its face like a cat that helps it locate prey in the dark and to steer clear of other hungry predators. Hold up! My devil senses are tingling! Dinner is served! Devils usually amble with a slow gait, but can gallop quickly with both hind feet together, kind of like a horse. Catch me if you can, suckers! These little guys don't run from a fight, though. Tasmanian devils will gladly take on prey up to the size of a small kangaroo. This tough guy makes a variety of fierce noises, from harsh coughs and snarls to sharp sneezes to challenge other devils. Achoo! Yeah? Say that again. Achoo! Again, a devil dare ya. Achoo! Oh boy, you just opened up a whole can of trouble. But you don't want to be in close vicinity to these creatures when they're under stress. Tasmanian devils produce a strong, stinky odour when they're freaked out. Ew! Ah, oh, come on, dude, not again. I'm sorry, I'm stressed. The Tasmanian devil, giving a whole new meaning to kicking up a stink. A seahorse is a fish. Can you guess what a male seahorse is called? Is it a stallion seahorse? Or is it a buck? Or are the boys called bulls? If you guessed a seahorse male is called a stallion, you're right. You're called what? A stallion. Slow down there, stallion. Seahorses are found in shallow tropical and warm salt water throughout the world, from Great Britain to the Bahamas. They prefer to pasture where they can take cover in seagrass beds, coral reefs and mangroves. There are nearly 40 species of seahorse, from the bloated-looking big belly, which grows to the size of a hammer, to a tiny pygmy seahorse, only recently discovered because the adult is no bigger than a staple. Wow. A male seahorse is called a stallion. <laughs> and a female is called a mare. But this is no brood mare. The female seahorse passes her eggs over to the male and he bears the burden of pregnancy. Um, goodbye. Good luck with that. <laughs> the stallion is a super dad. He keeps the eggs in a stomach pouch which hatch into 2,000 tiny seahorses. Keep it down in there, kids. I've still got 800 bedtime stories to go. After a few weeks, the male gives birth, thousands of times over. I'll see you on weekends when I need my laundry done and a roast dinner. Bye! The baby seahorses aren't called foals. Like all baby fish, they're called fry. That's the last Dad will see of them. They drift in the currents joining planktonic friends avoiding predators, which is pretty much everything else in the ocean. The seahorse family where a super dad stallion really takes the reins of parenting. What do you get when you get a public park, add some nasty skin bumps, and then a pig? A common warthog. You're called what? A common warthog. Common as muck, those warthogs. These wild pigs are found in sub-Saharan Africa. That means most of the countries below the vast northern sand desert. Africa is home to some of the world's most photographed wild animals and boasts both the tallest and largest on land. The common warthog is none of the above. Certainly not! They are the foragers of Africa's woodlands and savannas, a feast of food for the omnivore pig. 
The grass cover provides shoots and fungi to snuffle out and offers up insects and eggs from nesting birds. Like most pigs, the warthog just loves a good mud bath. Kids! Bath time! Rolling in muck is more than just fun. The mud bath is a smart way to cool down in Africa's searing heat and protects pig skin from insect bites. Oh dear, look at those pigs at it again. They really are very common. Warthogs need this bath because like a pig, they don't have much hair. Their large flat heads are covered in wart-like bumps that can grow up to 12 centimetres long. Yeah! Do you think these large cheek protrusions make my eyes look baggy? Be honest. The warts are actually protective pads that help push thorns and branches away from their eyes when they're digging around. To complete their wild look, they have fearsome looking tusks that look like they're most suited to a hardened carnivore. Despite their intimidating facade, they're known for being scaredy cats. They run away from trouble when they can. The common warthog. The swine that proves taking a walk on the wild side doesn't make you so scary. Here's another marine mashup. What do you get when you cross a horse? A shoe plus a crab? It's a horseshoe crab, of course. What? A horse, shoe, crab. There are four species of the ancient horseshoe crab. Three live in Southeast Asia and the other on the Atlantic coast of America. They scuttle along the ocean floor, prefer the shallows around creeks and estuaries with a sandy or muddy bottom. Excuse me, sunny boy, coming through? The horseshoe crab is old, really old. Its ancestors can be tracked back nearly 450 million years, 200 million years before dinosaurs walked the earth. Wow. I remember how the dinosaurs all died. It was a... Uh, uh... You don't last that long without a solid survival strategy. For this living fossil, it's rock hard... Feel that, Sonny? Military. It takes a predator with tough teeth or beaks to crunch through these hardy shells. I've been fighting off the enemy before you even walked out of the ocean. The Jurassic period, now those were tough times. They have eyes in the back of that shell and underneath, a mouth in the middle of their body. They mash up their food, mostly worms and mollusks, with five pairs of legs, each tipped with claws. I like it mashed. Here's the bad news for the horseshoe crab. Oh, now watch. They're not even a real crab. They don't have antennae. Oh, I thought the television was playing up. They're more closely related to spiders and scorpions, but really, they're in a class of their own. You got that straight. The horseshoe crab, a blue blood true fossil we should take our hats off to in respect. <laughs> when horse-like giraffes get together, they are often called a herd. But they have another group name that's tailor-made for this tall order. Can you guess what it is? Is it a tower of giraffes? Or mountain of giraffes? Or is it a palm of giraffes? The answer is... A tower of giraffes! A what? A tower of giraffes! Why, hello down there! The giraffe is one of Africa's most recognisable animals. It lives throughout the central, eastern and southern parts of the continent. They're mostly seen roaming savanna country, but you can also spot them in deserts, dense forests and open plains. These gentle giants are the world's tallest living land animals. An adult male can grow to around five and a half metres. That's taller than three adult humans standing on each other's heads. Wow! We're reaching new heights. These towers usually have around 15 individuals, led by an adult male. But that's where the organisation ends. Herds are willing to accept all members of any age or gender. We have an open door policy. All members welcome. Male giraffes fight by butting their long necks and heads, also known as necking. What? Necking. But don't worry, these fights aren't dangerous and usually end when one bull admits defeat and walks away. This argument isn't worth it. You're being a real pain in the neck. A giraffe's height is helpful for keeping a lookout for Africa's notorious predators, like lions and hyenas. 
Their excellent eyesight also allows them to spot hungry beasts from far away. A tower of giraffes! The gentle giants with a game plan to get ahead of the savannah competition. ID crisis! Here's an ID crisis of epic proportions. What do you get when you add H2O to a mythical creature? It's a water dragon! You're called what? A water dragon. I'm a water dragon? Outstanding! I always knew I was meant for greatness. Water dragons can be found across Australia and Asia. The larger Asian dragon is more colourful to match the vivid tropical landscapes. The Australian water dragon sticks to the east coast and likes a nice bush setting anywhere near, you guessed it, water. Water dragons are from a very ancient line of lizards. They've been around as long as crocodiles, about 20 million years. Can we skip to the part where I breathe fire? Wait, won't the water put it out? Snakes, large birds and meat-eating mammals will catch and eat water dragons. Domestic animals like cats and dogs will chase them too. We'll see about that. Wait till I unleash my fire. The bad news for the water dragon is, of course, dragons don't exist. Wait, what? However, they have their own powerful ability. They can escape to water where they can hold their breath for well over an hour. Breath holding? It's hardly fire breathing. Am I really not a dragon? No, perhaps the only thing that these lizards have in common with their fabled namesakes are their long, powerful legs. They can even run on two legs, much like a dinosaur. A dinosaur, you say? Yes, that's impressive. I'm a dinosaur. No, a lizard, the water dragon. ID crisis, soul. We shall walk the earth again. What do you get when you cross a squawking cockatoo, a buzzing wasp, plus a fish? A cockatoo wasp fish. You're called what? A cockatoo wasp fish. That sounds busy. I'm really not. This wasp fish lives in Western Pacific Oceans from Australia all the way up to Japan. They move about in the shallows around rocky reefs and seagrass beds, which are nurseries for the tiny fish larvae, crabs and shrimp the wasp fish likes to nibble on. Like a bear chewing on wasps, the name cockatoo wasp fish is a lot to digest. I'll step it out with you. The Australian cockatoo and European wasps are both incredibly active. The cockatoo wasp fish does this. It's a terrible swimmer. It mostly drifts with the prevailing current. To help with direction, it has a massive rudder on top of its head. The dorsal fin comes right up to the forehead. And when it's at full mast, looks just like a cockatoo crest. Sun's up! Morning, everyone! The cockatoo wasp fish is not a morning fish. It hides in the daytime to avoid fast swimming predators and comes out at dusk to feed at night. Their fins are a pincushion of venomous spines. That's what makes it a wasp fish. It's part of a larger family of toxic species. Nice spikes! Thanks, same. Unlike the horseshoe crab, which isn't a crab, and a koala bear, not a bear, the wasp fish is a fish, but acts like a dead leaf. They take on the brown and yellow autumn colours of a fallen leaf and swim like they're caught in the current. Whoa! Meant that! The cockatoo wasp fish. The fish with a busy name, but a breezy attitude. What do you get when you take a citrus fruit garden, cross it with a fast flying bird, and then with a baby butterfly? An orchid swallowtail caterpillar, of course. You're called what? An orchid swallowtail caterpillar? Oh, that sounds so glamorous. Am I? These creepy crawlies are found in Australia along the east coast all the way up into Papua New Guinea. They like it warm, soaking up the heat in leafy, treed areas and backyard gardens, especially if your garden has any lemon, lime and orange trees. Citrus leaves are its favourite food. Despite the sweet taste and smell of citrus, the little larva has one very big drawback. 
It looks just like poo. <laughs> the orchid swallowtail caterpillar is a mottled mixture of green, white and brown. From above, it looks just like a bird dropping sitting on a leaf or the ground. Poop and proud. It evolved to look this way to put predators off dinner. Magpies love to eat protein-rich caterpillars. But if you're a slow crawler who can't quickly hide, looking like something you would rather not eat is a life-saving tactic. And if that doesn't put them off, they have another trick straight from the toilet. They will smell like poo. Was that you? Yes, yes it was. But after suffering the early stages of looking and smelling gross, there is a rainbow at the end of this caterpillar's life. It turns into the orchid swallowtail butterfly, one of the largest butterflies in Australia, with a reputation for chasing away birds from its territory. Yeah, get out of here, buddy. Who's poo now? <laughs> the orchid swallowtail. It took tough little caterpillar life to become a big, beautiful butterfly. What happens when you mash a dog with a mean set of chompers and a fish? You get a dog tooth tuna. You're called what? Dog tooth tuna. Good boy. <laughs> Dog tooth tuna love to hang out in coral rich waters around the Indo Pacific region all the way up into the Red Sea. They're a supersized reef hunter looking for bait schools that gather up in high currents near sharp coral drop offs. These big doggies can grow up to the size of five Staffordshire Terriers, but on average, they're more like a Great Dane puppy. They have big barreled bodies, but they're streamlined like a torpedo to push through the water with speed. They swim as fast as a lion running as fast as it can. Ah, oh, here's the good boy then. Not this one. It's got more bite than bark. Dog tooth tuna have a row of large canine-like chompers. They're big and cone-shaped to really lock onto the medium-sized schooling fish and squid they chase down. Here, boy, dinner. Doggy dinner time is usually just before dusk, as deep water fish don't like the bright sunlight, but often do like to feed on fish that hang in shallow water. Most tuna don't have many teeth. The dog tooth tuna's name is a red herring. It's actually a part of the mackerel family. Neither dog nor tuna, this fierce fish is a true predator unleashed.